Outliers, Breaking Barriers, Shaping Tomorrow. How is everybody today? Doing good? I can't really see anybody because the light is shining right in my eyes. So maybe I, I come to the side here. So first of all, thank you for Presetia Mulya University for inviting me today. And um, I just want to give you a bit of a run through um, on some of my ideas in relation um, to this matter. So what I've been asked to speak about is redefining Indonesia's um, startup landscape, which um, some of you might be aware of. I really can't see the crowd at all because of the, uh, the shiny thing, but any of you guys in the audience working for any startup companies at all? Anybody? No? Okay. Um, so if you have been working for startup companies in the last few years, you will realize that there's been quite a lot of issues around the sector. So first of all, this is me. Um, I'm not a technology expert at all. I kind of got here by default. I was originally uh, working in finance and have been in Asia for 25 years, mainly Tokyo and Hong Kong. Um, it's only in the last few years I became an individual investor. And as part of becoming an individual investor, I ended up taking over the company I invested in. And um, now I've been here for six years running a B2B startup company, which I will discuss further later, um, called Bumivata Technology. Um, some of my uh, staff are here today, which is very nice of them, supporting me. Um, so yeah, I've been here since 2018 when we started our journey, and it's been very interesting. And uh, our office is very close to here in, um, uh, in Forest Tiga near Cubig. Right, so this is uh, information regarding the startup world. Um, the amount of money invested into Indonesian startups has decreased dramatically in the last few years after having a huge run from 2010 onwards with all the large unicorns and all these other businesses that were growing very fast. So this is, there's been an absolutely huge growth and then suddenly it stopped and is down 90% in the last few years, which, which is quite staggering numbers if you consider it. So yeah, what, what went wrong? I mean, what, what's the situation in, in relation to this? Why has everything changed? Um, the truth is at the moment, um, you can see here quite simply, there's been, um, the valuations of all companies has gone down dramatically. Um, this is part of, you know, we've had a, multiple IPOs of large companies and their, um, their stock price is down 80 to 90%. This has obviously discouraged people from investing further. Recently, we've had, unfortunately, fraud allegations where it suggested that companies are actually making up their revenue to get more and more investment in, which obviously brings about a huge loss in confidence in the sector. So it's, this is something that's no real surprise to me. Um, anyone who watches me on LinkedIn, or sorry, follows me on LinkedIn will realize that for the last five years, I've had a little lack of understanding of where startup valuations come from. Um, I worked in capital markets for many years, and I know how to value businesses. And basically, as far as I could see, most startup companies introduced new metrics just to create new valuations, which of course, long-term was always going to be a problem. And when I brought this up with people in the startup and the VC space here, they looked at me as if I was crazy. Like, you can't say this, you don't understand technology, you don't understand the new market. But history tells me, we've seen it throughout history, usually things return to the mean. So we had the dot-com bubble in the late 90s, we had the real estate bubble that brought banks down in the late 2000s. You know, if something looks too good to be true, it usually is. And when you have huge companies valued at billions of dollars, losing hundreds of millions of dollars, it doesn't make sense to any real investment professional. And unfortunately, a lot of the people in the startup world here were not professionally qualified as investment managers. So this is one of the main issues that's occurred. And 
And how do we move forward? I mean, there's a lot of humble pie to be eaten because a lot of people have continued to talk about you know, unicorns, sunicorns, they've wrote books about it. But, you know, the reality was always far removed from what they were saying. And it's very easy when you've got free money to keep on doing this, but interest rates are a part of, you know, a part of financial history. So governments use interest rates to cool down economies when they get over, overheated. And obviously this market was hugely overheated. And basically the minute free money dried up, most of these companies were in deep trouble because they require on constant investment money to survive. So to move forward successfully, we have to face this. We, ha we can't have a situation where people are blaming interest rates because that's just stupid because the interest rates have always existed. Why did we get to this stage? And so how can we stop the failings of the past? Because I believe this current tech winter, as they state, can actually create um, a lot of opportunity. So we're seeing what went wrong, you know, People have focused purely on valuations, va vanity metrics that were just made up basically. Again, unfortunately, a lot of the VC managers and founders, they have, yes, they have MBAs from Ivy League universities, but very little practical experience. Um, it became the culture here to be a three times founder, start a business, sell the business, start a business, sell the business. If you look at the generational companies in America, you know, Jeff Bezos, these guys are still at the companies they founded. You know, Jeff Bezos at Amazon, um, the guy is still at Nvidia, and Bill Gates is still part of the market. These guys didn't start the business just to get into the next business. So this has been a huge issue here, the culture of doing this. And to be honest, most of the startups here are just applications that can be easily replicated and have been promotion driven. So people have used the product because it was free or cheap and then you have to make them pay later. So, and again, again, lack of meritocracy. Who are the people involved in the startup world? Generally, they are the kids of people, not necessarily the people with the best ideas. So yeah, how do we make changes in the future? It's, it's very, very simple. It's not, not complicated at all. Um, if you just focus on evaluation and try to exit the company, you don't really believe in the long-term um, the long-term prospects of the company, do you? Because why would you want to sell your shares? We see all these founders here selling their shares in Series E, Series B. It astonishes me that investors allow them to do that because that for me shows a complete lack of belief in your, in your company's going to succeed. So you see a lot of this three-time founders and people just getting in, getting out, um, and again, this, you know, all these people in these unicorns, most of them are out. They are either running VCs or they are advising the government or even, even more. Um, you know, if they really believed in the long-term future of that company, why are they out so quickly? So again, it's the culture of get rich quick. Stop focusing on TAM metrics. TAM metrics in Indonesia count for absolutely nothing. I remember talking to a friend of mine who, who's in the audience actually today about this a few years ago. Indonesia has 275 million people, but that doesn't mean every single person is going to buy your product. Yes, there may be tens of millions of SMEs, but most of these are, you know, companies that may not want to use technology. They may not want to have fintech because they may not want to pay taxes on, on, on a lot of these smaller people. They want to use cash still because they don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to be on the grid. There's a lot of assumptions being made by people with their offices in Ashton Tower. You know, basically saying that everybody wants our software, everybody wants the, this. So the, the market's huge here, we get this, but you need to focus on the market that's actually can, can be used. So how many of those people are middle class can buy your product? Because, you know, some of the investment I see at the moment is not disruption. If a lot of the things have already been looked at by the big companies in Indonesia and the big companies in Indonesia have decided that they can't make a profit from that, that product. So for example, financial inclusion. There is a reason that BCA have chosen not to take those clients on. This is the richest person in the country. Why do they not want to take these clients on? Because generally they are, yes, there's many of them, but you lose money on each client. So there's many things here that's purely been based on the size of the population or the number of businesses 
without working out, can we make money from those people? And do those people even want our product? Do small shops want software for accounting? Do they require everything to be paid for by Curis? Not always. So I think there's too many assumptions being made and using the wrong metrics. Um, I think we need smaller and leaner VCs, for sure. There's too many um, billion dollar VCs. That's highly, it's very difficult to allocate money like a um, billion dollar, when you've got a billion dollar fund in illiquid assets, it's very hard to allocate the money. Some of my friends own some of the biggest Japanese hedge funds and they close them at a billion dollars. And this is one of the most liquid markets in the world. So the problem when you get bigger um, funds is that you end up allocating larger amounts to each, each investment. So in, you can't write a check for $2 million when your um, fund is $500 million. So what happens is all the money goes into the same businesses. The Sunicorns, the Unicorns, follow-on investment into the same businesses. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we see the problems we've had. We need smaller and leaner VCs, and we need it run by professionals who've got proper experience. It doesn't help you being related to somebody when it comes to running serious money, and this is something that needs addressing. I believe there needs to be more B2B and deep technology, I think it's very important. This is what we're doing at B uh, BVT, and I will come on to now. And I think it's extremely important that the government makes it easier for the large global tech companies to come. Very quickly, Vietnam has benefited hugely from Intel, from NVIDIA coming into their country and creating jobs, and then people learn, and then there's so many spin-offs. So instead of being ex go -car, sorry, ex go -jack, or ex-Grab, people are now ex-Intel, ex-NVIDIA, and it allows them to you know, have a better um, technology background and able to build better products. So why, I mean, why did I come to Indonesia? I came to Indonesia for many of the reasons that everybody else does. The opportunity is huge, the market's huge, but it's got to be, you've got to look beyond just the numbers here. And what do I do here? Um, well, Bumivata Technology. Um, as I said, our office is close to here. Um, founded in 2018, we are a location analytics company. We help companies make better decisions in relation to where they open the new store, their sales projections. Um, we help FMCG companies with white space analysis. Effectively, anything that's linked to data, we we basically, we map data, anything linking data and location. We map all kinds of data, and then we use AI and machine learning to make predictions for clients. And our clients range from SC Johnson, to McDonald's, to ST Indonesia, to Astra. So it's a, we have around 55 clients now. Um, and B2B is very difficult because you can't blow up the valuation. We don't have any venture capital investors. The investors are basically me and my friends. So it takes time to grow this kind of business. You can't just build it up and get out. But the benefit is now we are in a position where we are expanding to Vietnam, to Japan, and we're not having this tech winter problem. We're hiring more people because we're not leveraged and we've always done things in a way we believe was, was the best way to do business. So why, again, why do I think location analytics is big business? Well. If you can see this from Boston Consulting, they believe that using um, location and intelligence software can increase in various metrics of your business from between 20, sorry, between I think 30 and 100%. So it's a huge potential uptick in your business. And I believe that a lot of these new companies, startup companies, companies coming to Indonesia are going to need location analytics to make better decisions. So. You know, in the past, I think a lot of the startup companies F and the F&B companies, they haven't necessarily cared about, you know, making money. It's all about revenue and spending money. But I think now more and more companies have to look about profitability. So using our software can add significant money and ex ex significant profits for people. So I believe this is something that Indonesia 
is when we first came and started this business, people looked at me as if I was crazy. People were like, you know, we don't need, this is too, too, too early for Indonesia. But I think what people have realized as we've built up our use cases and people like Honda use our software and, and many, many different companies are using this com software, s SC Johnson, and we, people realize that it can add significantly, significant profitability and also cut your costs. And we think that Indonesia is a huge country. It, there is, it's logistically challenged. It's, it has a huge amount of data, but the data is all in different places. And what we aim to do is put all that data in one place and allow us to make you know, healthy decisions. And I think, you know, when, when I look at this, why are we not in trouble? Why are we not in the kind of position that many startup companies are in? And I think it comes back to you know, my attitude. My attitude was never to get in, get out, make money and sell, sell to the next investor. My aim was to build a generational company. Now, historically, globally, generational companies are not built by getting in, starting your company to sell to the VC and move on. But I think it's because of the huge potential in Indonesia with the population, that's become the thing to do and what's become normal between the venture capitalists and the founders. And a lot of these people are very relate, connected to each other, related to each other. So this has been kind of the way that they've been operating. Let's start a business, build it up, and then sell it to foreign investors or try to IPO the business. But that always works when interest rates are low and um, when your country is the most popular investment country or one of the most, like a couple of years ago. But now we're in a situation where you, you need to be sustainable. And because of the lack, I think if you look at the 275 million population, unfortunately, that it, that's kind of a fake number when you look at it because per capita, we are still around, GDP per capita is still, still around 4,700, which means that just being able to reach hundreds of millions of customers is not necessarily any benefit to your business. So we need to see more innovation because if you take the oligarchs out, the average Indonesian is living on $3,000 a year, which is not enough to support all these B2C startups. So I think there needs to be a look at increasing innovation, real technology. You know, we can take our technology overseas. Why can't other Indonesian companies take their technology overseas? There needs to be a look at this. There needs to be something. Indonesia should have its own technology sovereignty. It's still largely a middleman economy where Indonesia has all these apps, but when it comes to technology, they import from overseas. The biggest technology company is a distribution company. They distribute mainly foreign software. So I think going forward, there needs to be increased innovation. And I think it would be massively helped if there was some agreement made where the large international corporations can come here and help uplift the population as a whole. So I think actually um, my time is nearly done. Um, anyone who knows me will tell you I could talk all day. But um, thanks very much for having me today. Um, I'm sorry I can't see anybody in the audience because the line, light is shining in my eyes. But um, God bless Indonesia and thank you.